Frigidiro. Harry dipped a finger in the glass of water on his desk. It ought to have been cold. But lukewarm it had been, and lukewarm it had stayed. Again. Harry was feeling very, very cheated. There were hundreds of fantasy novels scattered around the Varus household. Harry had read quite a few, and it was starting to look like he had a mysterious dark side. So after the glass of water had refused to cooperate the first few times, Harry had glanced around the charms classroom to make sure no one was watching, taken a deep breath, focused, and made himself angry. Thought about the Slytherin's bullying Neville, and the game where someone knocked down your books every time you tried to pick them back up again. Thought about what Draco Malfoy had said about the ten-year-old Lovegood girl and how the Wizengamot really operated. And the fury had entered his blood. He had held out his wand in a hand that trembled with hate and said in cold tones, Frigidiro. And absolutely nothing had happened. He wanted to write someone and demand a refund on his dark side, which clearly ought to have irresistible magical powers, but had turned out to be defective. Frigidiro. Her water was solid ice, and there were white crystals forming on the rim of her glass. She seemed to be totally focused on her own work, and not at all conscious of the other students in class staring at her with hateful eyes, which was either A, dangerously oblivious of her, or B, a perfectly honed performance rising to the level of fine art. Oh, very good, Miss Granger. Excellent. Stupendous. Harry had expected to be, in the worst case, second behind Hermione. Harry would have preferred for her to be rivaling him, of course, but he could have accepted it the other way around. As of Monday, Harry was headed for the bottom of the class. Harry looked over at Hermione. It was the obvious role for her in the scheme of things. Hermione, do you have any idea what I might be doing wrong? Hermione's eyes lit up with a terrible light of helpfulness, and something in the back of Harry's brain screamed in desperate humiliation. Five minutes later, Harry's water did seem noticeably cooler than room temperature, and Hermione had given him a few verbal pats on the head and told him to pronounce it more carefully next time and gone off to help someone else. Professor Flitwick had given her a house point for helping him. I don't care if it's unfair competition. I know exactly what I am doing with two extra hours every day. I am going to sit in my trunk and study until I am keeping up with Hermione. Transfiguration is some of the most complex and dangerous magic you will learn at Hogwarts. Anyone messing around in my class will leave and not come back. You have been warned. Her wand came down and tapped her desk, which smoothly reshaped itself into a pig. A couple of muggle-born students gave out small yelps. The pig looked around and snorted, seeming confused, and then became a desk again. Mr. Potter, would you care to guess whether this is a desk which I briefly transfigured into a pig, or if it began as a pig and I briefly removed the transfiguration? I'd guess it'd be easier to start with a pig, since if it started as a desk, it might not know how to stand up. No fault to you, Mr. Potter, but the correct answer is that in transfiguration class, you do not care to guess. Wrong answers will be graded with extreme severity. Questions left blank will be graded with great leniency. You must learn to know that you do not know. If I ask you any question, no matter how obvious or basic, and you answer, I'm not sure, I will not hold it against you and anyone who laughs will lose house points. Can you tell me why this rule exists, Mr. Potter? No. Correct. Transfiguration is more dangerous than apparition, which is not taught until your sixth year. Unfortunately, transfiguration must be learned and practiced at a young age in order to maximize your adult ability. There are many reasons why transfiguration is dangerous, but one reason stands above all the rest. Transfiguration is not permanent! Mr. Potter, suppose a student transfigured a block of wood into a glass of water and you drank it. What do you imagine might happen to you when the transfiguration wore off? There was a pause. Excuse me, I should not have asked that of you, Mr. Potter. I forgot that you are blessed with an unusually pessimistic imagination. If the worst happens in a case like that, is there any way of maintaining the transfiguration? No. Sustaining a transfiguration is a constant drain on your magic which scales with the size of the target form, and you would need to recontact the target every few hours which is, in a case like this, impossible. You will absolutely never, under any circumstances, transfigure anything into a liquid or a gas. No water, 
No air. Nothing like water. Nothing like air. Even if it is not meant to drink. Liquid evaporates. Little bits and pieces of it get into the air. You will not transfigure anything that is to be burned. It will make smoke and someone could breathe that smoke. You will never transfigure anything that could conceivably get inside anyone's body by any means. You will never transfigure anything that looks like money, including muggle money. The goblins have way of finding out who did it. And above all, you will not transfigure any living subject, especially yourselves. It will make you very sick and possibly dead, depending on how you transfigure yourself and how long you maintain the change. Mr. Potter is currently holding up a questioning hand because he has seen an animagus transformation. In particular, a human transforming into a cat and back again. But an animagus transformation is not free transfiguration. The most general form of transfiguration, free transfiguration, which is what you will be learning here, is capable of transforming any subject into any target, at least so far as physical form is concerned. For this reason, free transfiguration must be done wordlessly. Using charms would require different words for every different transformation between subject and target. Some teachers begin with transfiguration charms and move on to free transfiguration afterward. Yes, that would be much easier in the beginning, but it can set you in a poor mold which impairs your abilities later. And to answer Mr. Potter's question, it is free transfiguration which you must never do on any living subject. There are charms and potions which can safely, reversibly transform living subject in limited ways. An animagus with a missing limb will still be missing that limb after transforming, for example. Now repeat after me. Even if the current defense professor at Hogwarts tells me that a transfiguration is safe, and even if I see the defense professor do it and nothing bad seems to happen, I will not try it myself. I have the absolute right to refuse to perform any transfiguration about which I feel the slightest bit nervous. Since not even the headmaster of Hogwarts can order me to do otherwise, I will certainly not accept any such order from the defense professor, even if the defense professor threatens to deduct 100 house points and have me expelled. We will repeat these rules at the start of every class for the first month. And now we will begin with matches as subjects and needles as targets. At the end of the class, Hermione had a silvery looking match and the entire rest of the class, muggle-born or otherwise, had exactly what they'd started with. Professor McGonagall awarded her another point for Ravenclaw. You know, I earned two points for Ravenclaw today, but that wasn't as good as your seven points. I guess I'm just not as intelligent as you. We have classes every day though. I wonder how long it'll take you to find some more Hufflepuffs to rescue. Today is Monday, so that gives you until Thursday. The two of them stared into each other's eyes, unblinking. Of course you realize, this means war. I didn't know we'd been at peace. Oh, Mr. Potter, I have some good news for you. Madam Pomfrey has approved your suggestion for preventing breakage in her spinster wickets, and the plan is to finish the job by the end of next week. I'd say that deserves... Let's call it ten points for Ravenclaw. My, I wonder if any other student has ever earned 17 house points on his first day of classes. I'll have to look it up, but I suspect that's a new record. Perhaps we should have an announcement at dinner time. But it wouldn't do to offend the Slytherins, so the announcement should be brief. Just the number of points and the fact of the record. And if anyone comes to you for help with their schoolwork and is disappointed that you haven't even started reading your textbooks, you can always refer them to Miss Granger. Professor! This is our war! Stop meddling! Now you have until Thursday of next week, Mr. Potter. Unless, of course, you engage in some sort of mischief and lose house points before then. Addressing a professor disrespectfully, for example. Professor McGonagall looked reflective. I expect you'll hit negative numbers before the end of Friday. My, I wonder how long it will take before Miss Granger does something which deserves a dinnertime announcement. I look forward to seeing it, whatever it may be. Harry and Hermione, by unspoken mutual consent, turned and stormed out of the classroom. Um, are we still on for after dinner? Of course. I wouldn't want you to fall farther behind on your studying. Why, thank you. And let me say that as brilliant as you are already, I can't help but wonder what you'll be like once you have some elementary training in rationality. Is that really that useful? It didn't seem to help you with charms or transfiguration. 
Well, I only got my school books four days ago. That's why I had to earn those 17 house points without using my wand. Four days ago? Maybe you can't read eight books in four days, but you might have at least read one. How many days will it take to finish at that rate? You know a lot of math, so can you tell me what's eight times four divided by zero? I've got classes now, which you didn't, but weekends are free, so... Lim Epsilon approaching zero plus of eight times four divided by Epsilon, 10.47 a.m. on Sunday. I did it in three days, actually. 2.47 p.m. on Saturday it is, then. I'm sure I'll find the time somewhere. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day.